We are reading through the four Gospels right now, having just finished the Gospel according to Matthew, and yesterday just starting the Gospel according to Mark. So we're pulling out a section of our reading and teaching on that each weekend, and I have gone to uh, Mark's Gospel chapter 1. So grab your Bibles, Mark's Gospel chapter 1. And the opening verse, the beginning of the gospel, it means good news about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It is written in Isaiah, the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way, a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John came. We've dubbed him John the Baptist, not because he's Baptist in terms of denomination, because the Baptist denomination didn't start until the 1600s. We call him John the Baptist because of what he did, baptizing in the desert. He baptized people. Baptizing in the desert region and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. The whole Judean countryside, all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. I think some went out just to see this dude. Because if you know anything about him, his dress, he wore camel's hair, he had a big leather belt, his diet was unique, he ate locust and wild honey. I picture John the Baptist, if he had come in our day, as a big, burly biker. He's got black leather. He's got a chain hooked to his wallet and to his belt. He's got a really gruff voice, and he comes riding in. <laughs> Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. He's a lone voice, and he has a simple message to understand. He has the privilege of introducing Jesus to the world and the world to Jesus, Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, some believe that John the Baptist was a part of a group called the Essenes. We don't know that, but there are some similarities. For example, the Essenes lived in the desert region down south of Jerusalem. They had practices that were not practices that the normal culture would practice, religious practices. Uh, one of them was baptism. They cited as their reason for living in the desert, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, which we just read a portion of about John the Baptist. A voice of one calling in the desert. And so they lived in the desert. They said, we've separated ourselves unto God. We're not like everybody else. They practiced baptism by immersion. We practice baptism by immersion. We take you all the way under, and thank God we don't leave you there. We keep some people under a little longer than others. We bring you back out. Because the picture is the death, the burial, the resurrection of Christ. And by faith in what Christ has done, you're dead to your old life. And now you have a new life by faith in Christ. And in the process, you've been washed, you've been cleansed. People would come out to be baptized by John. Now, Matthew, if you go there to Matthew chapter 3 just for a minute, Matthew tells us there were some people that came out to be baptized, or at least to see what was happening with John baptizing people. Verse 7, Matthew chapter 3. When he, John, uh, saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, You brood of vipers! Whoa! You bunch of snakes! Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. They were the religious leaders of the day. 
And as religious as they were, by John's estimation, they needed to repent. One of their problems was they were self-righteous because they based their righteousness on comparing themselves with everybody else. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Verse 9, And do not think you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. Don't depend on your religious heritage. I tell you, out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees. And every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Fastest people going to what the Bible calls hell are religious people who think God would never send me to hell. I have 10 points. I know you're worried. Some of them will go fairly fast. They all have to do with repentance and a baptism unto repentance. And here's what's very clear from the Scriptures. Baptism without repentance is simply a religious act. And it doesn't matter what mode of baptism. You know, some groups, some churches, uh, they don't do what we do. They don't take you all the way under. They just sprinkle you. Intention is still the same. It's a cleansing. But if there's no repentance, it's very clear from the Scriptures. Very clear here. <laughs> baptism without repentance is simply a religious act. Do you no good? No merit before God just to go through some religious act. Repentance involves confessing sin. Now, we don't understand what he's talking about here. When they came uh, to John the Baptist confessing their sins, <laughs> they didn't come with a list. <laughs> this is what I did when I was five years old. Man, it was bad. But boy, by the time I got to eight years old, the list was longer. And when I hit middle school, Oh, man. It's not, a, it's not an itemized list of here's all the things I've done. No. It's a general conviction by the Holy Spirit. Uh, you know you have need because you've made mistakes. You know you're a sinner. Sinner. Sin just means missing the mark. Missing the mark. For all have sinned. And fall short of the glory of God. Repentance involves confessing sin. Jesus and his disciples all preached repentance. Repentance. John the Baptist led the way. Repent. He introduces Jesus. Matthew chapter 4 verse 17. It says Jesus then began to preach. Repent. Same message. Then Jesus commissioned his disciples. And they went out and preached Repentance, it just means to turn, turn. You're confessing, I'm a sinner. I am going to turn from going my way. I'm going to turn to God and receive Christ as Lord and Savior. And without a Savior, we're all headed for hell. We need a Savior. His name is Jesus. And so you confess your sin, you receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, and now you're washed. By faith, you're cleansed. Old life is over. New life is begun. And by faith in Jesus Christ, you're cleansed. They preach, repent, because that's the only way. The only way. Now, everybody needs to repent. Religious people need to repent. They're the hardest ones to get to realize they need to repent because they think they're okay. Even the Apostle Paul said about his fellow Jewish brothers and sisters, Romans chapter 10, they have a zeal for God, but their zeal is not based on righteousness because they wouldn't submit to Christ's righteousness, which is by faith in what Christ did, not what you can do. You depend on what you can do, you're in real trouble. 
Because you may look good compared to other people, but all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's our problem. We've missed God's mark. Everybody needs to repent. Acts 17, God commands people everywhere, everywhere. doesn't matter where you live, where you've come from, what's your background. Everybody needs to repent. And without repentance, there's no salvation. Everybody needs to repent. Here's some really good news. God desires that everyone repent. God's not up there going, well, I don't really like them anyway. I, I hope they don't repent because I want to send them to hell. I can't wait to see them burn. You know, it's ridiculous. The Bible tells us hell was created for the devil and his angels. Only people that go to hell are people who choose to. The blood of Jesus is sufficient, no matter what the Calvinists say. It's sufficient for everyone. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him, whosoever, should not perish but have everlasting life. Second Peter, he writes and he says, God is not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. Let me tell you the way Ezekiel puts it. Ezekiel 18, verse 32, God says, I take no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Sovereign Lord. Repent and live. I thought about this. I thought about it in light of the news we all heard. I've never met him. I don't know any of his family. But when I heard the news, that Kobe Bryant was killed in that helicopter crash, and then his 13-year-old daughter gone with him, and my heart just sank. I got emotional. I'm getting emotional now just thinking about it. He's gone. Never even met him. Don't know his family. And he's a, he's a kind of a figure that when, when that happened, Word began to spread like wildfire around the globe because he's world known. He's a worldwide celebrity. He didn't plan on dying that day. But he's gone. And his 13-year-old daughter, they're gone. God took me to Luke's Gospel, chapter 13, as I was thinking about it. In Luke chapter 13, some people come to Jesus. And they say, now there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Pilate, wicked guy, hated Christians, hated Jews who worshiped the God of Israel. And what they're referring to are some Galileans, some Israelites, and in the act of worship under the Old Testament economy where they're bringing sacrifices, and so they're blood sacrifices. And while they're offering these blood sacrifices in worship to their God, in the midst of their act of worship, Pilate commands some of his henchmen to come in and murder them. And as they are killed, their blood mixes with the blood of the very sacrifices they're offering to God. And, and people are asking Jesus, why would God allow that? Why'd that happen? And notice the answer, verse 2. Jesus answered, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. He doesn't stop there. Look at what he says in verse 4. Are those 18 who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them? 
That was a recent, recent tragedy, an accident. 18 people die. Tower falls on them. Do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you too will perish. What's the point that he's making? It's very clear. The point that he's making is that you're all going to die. You don't know how you're going to die. You don't know when you're going to die, but you're going to die. And Kobe Bryant did not expect to die when he did, but he's gone. And there is no guarantee for any single person here. Listen, every breath you take is a gift from God. Don't you play Russian roulette with your soul. If you die today and you've never repented and received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you are headed for a Christless eternity and you will forever and ever and ever and ever and ever regret it. Because you had a chance. You had an opportunity. Everybody has an opportunity because God wants everybody to repent. He wants everyone to repent. As much as my heart grieved for Kobe Bryant, and I've never met him, I don't know any of his family, imagine how the heart of God grieves. Because he doesn't want anybody to go to hell. He didn't create hell for us. You say, I don't believe in hell. You better be right. And I'm going to tell you something. Jesus believes in hell. He talked more about hell recorded in these pages of the four Gospels than he did about heaven. More record of Jesus talking about hell than he talked about heaven. I think one of the reasons is he doesn't want anybody to go to hell. He desires everyone to repent. You know what repentance does? Removes the obstacles between me and God. Some people listening right now, you may be going, I know I need to repent. I know I need to receive Jesus. I'm just not ready. Here's what they mean by that. There's something that's in the way. For me, young teenager, my mother and grandmother had taken me to the Baptist church right down the road when I was just a little kid, Emmanuel Baptist Church, Pastor Milton Frazier. Years passed. By the time I got in middle school, I ain't going to the Baptist church. I ain't going to church at all. <laughs> I'm going where the girls are. I'm going where the cool people are. I'm going where the parties are. I became a drummer. I started getting invited with a little band we had to play at these birthday parties. I was a rock star. I ain't going to church. Now, in the Baptist denomination, a lot of them have what we call or what they call visitation. Not any Baptists here. Last service, there were Baptists because they responded when I mentioned visitation. Let me tell you what visitation is. There's a night of the week, and anybody that wants to, and it's only a small number that are, that are willing to do it, Baptists that go to that church, and you come, and somehow you've got names of people that you're going to go and visit. And you're going to share the gospel with them. You're going to share Christ with them. Or you're going to invite them back to church. They used to go years ago, but they've stopped going, you know. And you're going you're to try to encourage them to get back involved. And so you, you, you have visitation. Well, somehow, they got my name. Probably my mother, maybe my grandmother, but somehow they got my name. And all of a sudden, before I could go out and party this one night, all of a sudden, my mother comes and says, there's this guy here, he's here to see you from Emmanuel Baptist Church. Oh. Sat me down, shared the gospel with me, talked with me. He was a nice guy. Nice. I can see him right now in my mind. Nicest guy in the world. Tried to lead me in a prayer. I'm like, mm, nah. Why? There were things in between me and doing that. Because I knew. I knew enough when I was a child. I knew enough to know that if I was going to do that, if I was going to do that, if I was going to pray that prayer, you know, if I was going to repent, that means <laughs> the party life, the party life, at least the way, I, the way I knew it. I mean, it was over with. Okay? And I'm like, I'm having too much fun. 
I'm enjoying life too much. And who, what foolish person ever said sin is not fun? If you didn't enjoy sexual immorality, why would you do it? I, I hate it. Oh, you love it. But it's still sin. You're involved with somebody not your wife, not your husband. That's called sin. I was involved. I was partying. I was doing drugs. I was drinking, you know. And, man, we had some great times. I had some great friends, and we had some great parties. I was living it up. And so when that guy come from the Baptist church from visitation night to my house, nah. I am forever thankful that I didn't die. I get up one Saturday morning at the crack of noon. I'd been partying, 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 partying early into the morning. By the time I go outside, I looked at the driver's no, it was the passenger side of my car. The whole side of the car was crashed in, but still drivable. To this day, I'm telling you, too, to this day, I have no idea how I drove that car home, and I have no idea what happened to the side of that car. That's how messed up I was. I have no recollection of coming home that night. No recollection. No recollection of how my car got damaged. That's how bad it was. There's so many times I could have died. And I was afraid to die because I knew the truth. I knew from when I was a little boy, I'd heard the truth about Jesus. I knew I, knew I needed to repent. I knew it. When I'm 18 years old, I met this girl. I fell head over heels in love with her. I thought, this is the girl of my dreams. One day we'll get married. We weren't married. We were living together off and on. It was while I was dating her that the Holy Spirit began to convict me so deeply. I knew. I knew I needed to get right with God. I knew it. I would get very moody. We'd be out. We'd be drinking and stuff. And she wasn't a druggie. She drank. We'd go to the bars, but she wasn't a druggie, and she was influential in getting me off the drugs. God used this relationship to help get me off the drugs. But I'd still go out and drink with her. And I knew, I knew she loved me when our first, my first birthday being together with her, she gave me a carton of Winston cigarettes. <laughs> Not a pack. She gave me a carton. I knew she loved me. <laughs> we were in love, and I thought she's the girl of my dreams. But I began to be convicted. I would get moody, especially when we had been drinking, you know. I would cry, and she would say, what's wrong? And I'd say, I can't tell you. Because what I wanted to tell her was, I'm not right with God. One night, one night after several of these incidents over months, I turned to her. I turned to her as she's dropping me off at my house. That night, after we had been out partying, and she said, what's wrong? I said, I'm not right with God. It wasn't because I said that, but in a very short time after that, my life didn't change. She broke up with me. I was devastated. I, was de I couldn't eat. I would eat, and I would, I would throw up. It was the most painful thing I'd ever gone through in my life. I thought, my life is over. She broke it up with me. I'm never going to be miserable all my life, you know. But that helped to eventually open the door for me to be able to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And now I look back and realize she was not God's will for my life. Wendy was. And Wendy is so happy about that. Let me tell you, she's so happy about that. <laughs> that was a good one, wasn't it? That was, that was, <laughs> that was funny. <laughs> uh, Wendy was God's will for my life. 
And I finally repented. And I said, God, you can take anything. And I laid my life down, and I received Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And, and now the obstacles are out of the way. Listen, a girlfriend can be in the way. A boyfriend can be in the way. Somebody you love can be in the way. And a, a bad habit can be in the way. You know, money can get in the way. The rich young ruler. What repentance does, it removes the obstacles between you and God. And you finally say, okay, Lord, I repent. And it's the best thing you could ever do. I look back at the passage, and the full passage in Isaiah says, the valleys will be filled in, the mountains and hills made low, the crooked roads made straight, the rough ways made smooth. And for me, I put the valleys filled in. If you were a low life, a low life we've defined as a person considered morally unacceptable. The mountains and hills made low. That's the prideful person, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, thinking, I'm okay. No, you're not. The crooked roads made straight. That's the person that's just headed the wrong direction. And maybe even religiously, there is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Listen, Allah and Jesus can't both be right. The Jehovah's Witnesses and what we believe can't both be right. They're two different Jesuses. There's one path. There's one road. There's one Jesus. The rough ways, that's just the outright rebel made smooth. Whatever the obstacle is, whatever the hindrance is, repentance paves the way. Okay. Repentance is mysterious because repentance, the Bible says, is a gift of God. It's a gift of God. God grants someone repentance. It's a gift. We could not repent if God did not allow us to. But while it's a gift of God, because Jesus said nobody comes to the Father, nobody comes to me unless the Father draws him. But while it's an act of God and it's a gift, it's also a personal choice. I couldn't repent unless God gives me the opportunity, but it's a personal choice. Revelation 16 is the time in the yet future when cataclysmic events are happening on the earth in a period known as the Great Tribulation. And God's intention is, as things heat up, if you will, on the earth, God wants people to to repent. But it says there, as bad as things get, there are those, and it says it twice there in those few verses, that refuse to repent. They refuse to repent. It's a choice. It's a gift, but you can refuse the gift. You can no. Personal choice. It can be resisted. It can be resisted. A guy named Stephen gave a blistering message recorded in the book of Acts, and he talked about the history of the Jews and how often in history they had resisted the Holy Spirit. Resisted the Holy Spirit. Repeated resistance can be very bad. Damning. Here's some of the things that happens on repeated resistance. Number one, you can become calloused over time. I have a callous right here. I could take a pen, stick it right in this callus. I wouldn't feel a thing. I could go one inch below it. Ah! What's the difference? This is a callus. It's skin, but over time, over time, it has become callous and it become insensitive. The more you resist, the longer you resist, greater potential for callousness. Doesn't mean God's not speaking to you. It just means you're desensitized. You become calloused, and your heart can become calloused. Romans 1 says, those who continue to resist, God says, okay, I'll just let you go on your way. And you're given over to whatever it is your desire is. Now you're just free to live the way you want to live. Okay, that's the way you want to go, but you're headed for damnation. Not a good thing. And then the most sobering verse is in Proverbs 29, verse 1. Whoever remains stiff-necked after many rebukes will suddenly be destroyed without remedy. Repeated resistance, bad, 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 bad. Now, I don't know if you've been counting. I said I have 10 points. We're now at number 10. 
Now, a lot of us, a lot of us, and I, and I know this because I, I know your faces and you've been listening to me for a long time, and a lot of us I know you have, you have at some point in your life repented and received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And so for some of us, the majority of this message is like, I know this, I know this, I know this. Can we go to brunch? But here's the last point. Do you know repentance is necessary even after salvation? Seven letters to seven churches, they are intended to be messages for the church age that includes us. First church, Ephesus, Jesus commended them for so many things, and then he said, but I got one thing against you. You left your first love. As I've studied that, my understanding, that means two things. They're not as passionate for Jesus as they used to be. They're not in fellowship with the church as much as they used to be. You read Ephesians, that book of Ephesians that Paul wrote, your love for all the saints. There was something about fellowship and love for the saints. And, and somehow in life, while they got their doctrine down and they got organized and they could recognize false apostles, he said, but I hold this against you. Remember the height from which you've fallen. It was a big deal. They're saved, but he said, you've left your first love. And here was the counsel of that church. Do the things you did at first. And that's easy to think. What, what were the things I was doing when I first became a Christian, when I was so on fire? Just go back and start doing those things again. Do the things you did at first. Second church was the church of Pergamum. They got in a bad crowd. Bad crowd can be at church. There are people at church that aren't really committed to Jesus. They attend They got involved with a bad crowd. They got involved in sexual sin. And Jesus says, repent. Third church was the church of Thyatira. They committed the same sin as Pergamum with one noteworthy difference. They had been warned to repent, and they had resisted repeatedly. And now Jesus says, what's about to happen, you're not going to enjoy. Stop resisting. Repent. Fourth church was the church of Sardis, and they had a reputation of being alive, but Jesus says, but the truth is you're dead, spiritually. On the outside, everything's good. Come to church. Praise the Lord. Good to see you, brother. You know, But there's hidden sin in their life, hidden sin. What you see is not what you get. It's not the truth. It's not reality. They're living a life of hypocrisy. And the last church is probably one of the most practical for the church in America to hear because the church of Laodicea, it was the richest city, wealthy. A lot of retirees moved to Laodicea because they had these hot springs. The hot springs would provide water down into Laodicea, but by the time it got there, it was lukewarm. They were famous for an eye salve that people came from all over to get to help their eye problems. And Jesus uses these things as illustrations, and he says, now, get some salve for your eyes, because spiritually, you're not seeing too well. And he says, in regard to your spiritual condition, you're lukewarm. You're not hot. You're not cold. You're lukewarm. And he says, I'm about to spew you out of my mouth. In other words, you nauseate me. I'd rather you be hot or cold, but not half-hearted, not halfway, not wishy-washy. The one penning the gospel according to Mark had the privilege of going with the Apostle Paul on his first missionary journey. But Acts chapter 13 tells us that at a point along the way on that journey, John Mark decides, I'm going home. I'm going back to Mama. I'm going back to Jerusalem. We aren't told why, but it was not a good reason. They finished their first missionary journey, and Paul and Barnabas, who just happens to be John Mark's cousin, so he's a family member, they're starting to plan the second missionary journey, and Barnabas says to Paul, we should invite Mark. 
And Paul says, nah, -uh. he deserted us on the first one. He's not going on this one. And Paul and Barnabas have such a sharp disagreement that Paul chooses Silas, Barnabas chooses John Mark, and they go their separate ways in ministry. And the Holy Spirit follows the ministry of the Apostle Paul, which tells me Paul's the leader and he was also right. Here's the good news. Paul at some point realized that Mark had truly repented. He was truly sorry for deserting them on the first missionary journey. He had taken a step toward maturity. And Paul somehow realized that. And when he ends one of the letters to Timothy, he says, and send Mark because he's useful to me in the ministry. I think when Mark got that word, he was so encouraged. He was so refreshed. And here he is, back on the team. And not only did he have now the privilege because of his genuine repentance to go with the Apostle Paul and see people saved and churches planted, but Mark would have the ultimate privilege of pinning one of the four gospel accounts, the gospel according to Mark. What is it that God wants to do in your life if you would just repent? One last verse, I'm done. Acts 3.19, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. The word means a cooling, a recovery of breath, a revival. And that happens when you first repent and receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. But it also happens for the Christian who repents and the fresh ministry of the Holy Spirit. You get that peace that you once had. You get that fellowship with Jesus that you once had. And you have an open door now for God to be able to lead you and guide you. And now you're willing to go. And the things He wants to do in and through your life that He would not be able to do had you not repented. Bow with me. You're here or you're watching by live stream and you'd like to repent. It just means to turn. We all like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. You'd like to repent and receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. If that's you, as we're bowed in prayer, you pray from your heart. God hears you in your heart. He's God. He knows your thoughts. And would you just say from your heart, Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. Forgive me. Come into my life. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. Now help me to live for you the rest of this life. Still bow just for a moment. You're already a Christian, but as a Christian, you're convicted about something you need to repent of. If you haven't already done so, just confess it. Ask Him to cleanse you in a fresh way that fresh ministry of the Holy Spirit. As as a Christian, you confess whatever it is you need to repent of. Thank you, Father, for the privilege of repenting. Initially by faith in Jesus and then as a follower of Jesus. Thank you for that privilege. Thanks again for your grace and your mercy. Thank you that you do not treat us as our sins deserve. Look up at me just for a minute. I don't do this every time. I try to be led by the Spirit. I don't do it every time. But if you just pray to receive Christ as Lord and Savior. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, 
I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me before men, I'll deny you. And I like to say, if you can't confess Christ in a church service, how are you going to do it once you leave the church service? Because here, listen, even though the butterflies may be flying inside and you may be fearful about doing that, listen, when you do it, we're going to be happy for you. There are no enemies here. We're going to be like, yeah, like the people being baptized. We're going to be shouting, you know, like, yeah, because we've made that decision at some point. And we've confessed publicly that we've become followers of Jesus. Some people have been in the church for years, never been born again. That could be you. Maybe you just prayed to receive Christ, and you realize you've been in the church, but never really born again, as the Bible calls it. You just prayed to receive Christ. Get over the fear, because here you're among friends. You like to stand to your feet and say, by standing to my feet, I'm, tell, I'm saying, I just prayed that prayer to receive Christ as my Lord and Savior. Did you do that? I just prayed to receive Christ as my Lord and Savior. Praise the Lord. God bless you, God bless you. God bless you. Stay standing just for a minute. Stay standing just for a minute. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's all stand. Let's all stand. Let's sing this to the Lord. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No. blood of Jesus, so precious, and no precious is the flow that makes me white as snow, no Thank God for his word. Don't leave yet. Thank God for his word. Any of our leaders that are available to be up here after the service to pray for anybody that needs prayer, and if you prayed to receive Christ, we'd love to just get a record of your decision because we want to try to encourage you in some things that will help you grow in your faith. I can promise you we don't have a visitation group that's going to come knocking on your door. All right? We just want to try to encourage you. And if you prayed to receive Christ and you got a minute to come to one of our leaders and say, yeah, I just prayed to receive Christ, and we can at least get your name in contact so we can encourage you in some things that you will grow in your faith. And, of course, these leaders be glad to pray for anybody that needs prayer. So any leaders that are available for a few minutes after we dismiss, God bless you. I'm headed to Mexico to meet Jairus and the whosoever's. Pray for me as I go. God bless you. Amen. Have a Amen. And lastly, if you have an interest in joining our CCF choir, we're about to sing in a couple of weeks here. So come talk to me, and I'll give you some info.